All right, welcome back to Ultrasound Grand Rounds this week. I'm excited, as always, to be back here with you talking more about bedside ultrasound and how we can use ultrasound to really improve the care of our patients. And today, we're gonna change gears a little bit. We've been talking a lot about soft tissue ultrasound and some of the things that we can see in the soft tissues. But one of the things that we need to talk about, because we haven't done a ton of it, is OB ultrasound. We see a ton of preg patients who are pregnant in the emergency department. We scan those. In fact, when I was first starting an ultrasound many, many years ago, one of the most common studies that I did was the first trimester ultrasound just because it was so ubiquitous in terms of the patients that are coming in. So with that established, we are going to talk about OB, right? I'm going to start today with a normal first trimester ultrasound um, lecture, and then we're going to bring in some of our OB colleagues in future weeks to kind of fill in some of these other details kind of as we progress through pregnancy. So with that being said, let's transition on over to our slide deck and let's talk about the normal first trimester ultrasound. Sound. So our objectives are threefold today. We are going to basically overview, or talk about an overview of pregnancy, right? Um, we're going to do, talk a little bit about the management of pregnant patients in the ED, right? And then we're going to talk a little bit about the first trimester ultrasound and see how that builds from the, the needs and the, the issues that we come up with in the ED as, as, well, as pertains to kind of how we manage our patients, right? And so I like to kind of think about things from a very big picture perspective perspective. In fact, I was talking to uh, someone the other day um, about learning new things, right? Uh, it's always good to be learning new things um, and to be engaging our mind and kind of developing that and just exercising that side of ourselves, right? But it's always awkward because you just, there's so much to know and so much to kind of piece together. And you're trying to figure out where those cognitive links are and the big picture and how this plays into the bigger picture. And I know if we think back about our medical training, whatever you know, stage you are in your medical training, this is certainly a, a normal part of kind of your experience um, in, in healthcare, right? Uh, where you just come in and there's so much to know. And the more you do this, the more you begin to understand the broader picture, the bigger picture, kind of what the priorities are, what the patient needs, kind of where things are. Um, and then once you've been able to broaden up and look at that big picture, then we can narrow back down and look at the finer details. And so um, as I started putting this lecture together, I kind of had that motif in mind where I really want to go big picture uh, and talk very broadly, start with kind of a Vince Lombardi, this is a football type moment, um, and really build in and drill down from there how we get to using the bedside ultrasound. But before that, um, we got to talk about credentials, right? So um, I found it rather amusing, um, just the way we divided up things last week. Um, we talked about testicular ultrasound, and Dr. Werner did an amazing lecture on that one. And then now I'm going to flip the scales, and I'm going to talk about OB ultrasound today. Um, and I, just as a disclaimer, I have never been pregnant. Surprise! However, I've been... Uh, in close proximity to one, someone who has, right? And so this is the gratuitous, gratuitous picture of my family um, and my, my wife and my five children. Um, and so... I'll, while I have zero experience of what it means to be pregnant, I've been, um, like I said, in close proximity to my, to my wife as she's been pregnant and kind of seen that whole process play out times five now. Uh, and as a healthcare provider, I've also uh, studied this um, and taken care of a number of pregnant patients. And so um, hopefully I bring some small degree of, of credibility to this lecture. And if not, this is an amusing anecdote and just a, a shameless way of, of being able to show a picture of my amazing family. So um, anyway, Let's start from there. Um, let's back up. Let's talk big picture, okay? And I want to answer this question. What is pregnancy, right? And so uh, if we want to talk about first trimester ultrasound, I think it helps us to kind of know what we're ultrasounding, right? You know, like when you have a gallbladder, well, what is a gallbladder? What does it do? Um, and so um, the, the let's just, just start. Very basic. What is pregnancy, right? Pregnancy is the, this is according to the Department of Health and Human Services, right? Pregnancy is a period where a fetus develops inside a woman's uterus, right? So that's just definition right there, okay? Um, and so we usually think about it in the context of something that lasts approximately 40 weeks, right? And so this can be a little bit shortened, right? Um, I think most of my kids came out in that 38 to 40 weeks period. I think it was 39-ish weeks. Um, one of them, my first one was induced. Um, the second, the other five have been C-sections scheduled. Um, no, I take that back. Um, three through five have been C-sections. Um, but 
needless to say, um, all that takes place kind of in that 39th-ish week, right, of, of pregnancy. And if you start having babies a little bit earlier than that, right, in that what's, you know, the 37, 36, 35, 34 weeks, then we start talking about these being preterm babies and then potential complications that may arise as a result of, you know, getting the buns out of the oven a little bit too soon. That's, pardon the the, the silly cliche. But anyway, um, now pregnancy itself is divided into three basic um, sections, right? We call them trimesters. And again, I know this is super basic. I know we all know this, but I just want to establish the baseline here, right? It's divided into the first trimester, which we define as zero to 12 weeks, right? The second trimester, which is defined as 13 to 28 weeks. And finally, the third trimester, which is defined as 29 to 40 weeks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and so as we talk about doing ultrasound for these babies, right? there's going to be very different priorities, very different things that are going to come up in each of those trimesters that are going to be kind of on our mind and and um, things that we need to look out for. And so if you divide the pregnancy into these periods, right, the first trimester is really that period of of um, initial establishment, right, and organogenesis, right? And by the time you hit about 10 weeks, all of the organ systems are pretty much in place, right? That, that 10 to 12 week mark is when organogenesis um, is, is finished, right? And so you have an extraordinarily miniature version uh, of a baby at 12 weeks. Now, a lot needs to happen, right? If you took it outside of the uterus at that point, it would be, uh, it would not survive um, at 12 weeks given current um, current levels of, of healthcare technology. Um, but all the building blocks are there, right? They're fully established. And so zero to 12 weeks, we're really making you know, one single cell, right, that, that fertilized um, zygote turn into a, a proliferation of cells that resembles a human being, right? Second trimester, that weeks 13 to 28, um, even pushing through the, the f third trimester to weeks 40 is going to then be growth, right? As all these organ systems grow, develop, and mature, um, and then the baby just enlarges to the point where it is able to survive and then, you know, and hopefully thrive outside of the womb, right? Outside of the uterus um, at around that 38, 39, 40 week period, right? And so um, if you think about it in that physiologic or embryologic context, then the, the things that we need to look out for will be very, very different in each of those phases. So in the early phase, in the first trimester is like, where is the thing, right? Is it where it needs to be? And is it beginning to develop appropriately? Like it'd be silly to do a renal ultrasound on a baby at, you know, seven weeks, because it's just not there yet, right? Whereas when you get into your later, your second trimester, you're going to start doing some anatomy scans and start making sure that these organ systems that are that are online, that are developing, are developing appropriately, and they look anatomically correct compared to what they ought to be, uh, so that we can, you know, anticipate what issues are going to happen as we kind of approach that third trimester, and then, you know, what they call the fourth trimester, which is, you know, post-delivery, right? So that kind of helps us understand our priorities, kind of the, the things that we're going to need to anticipate. So let's kind of take that next zoom level, zoom in level step and talk about pregnancy in the ED, right? So what are our, um, what are the things that are going to bring patients into the emergency department when they're pregnant, right? And as I got to thinking about my practice, what I've seen, um, you know, and the other things that can you know, can happen, right, that bring pregnant patients into the, the emergency department, it really comes down to approximately three different, um, three different categories. <coughs> the first one is going to be, you know, a lot of women coming in saying, um, yeah, I took a pregnancy test at home, but I don't believe it. Um, and so I'd like you to confirm it, right? And as much as we would kind of whine and complain about how this is not an appropriate you know, use of the emergency department, um, it should be sent to, to the no biggie department. Um, you know, the reality is patients want to know the answer and they present to us. And so um, it's not unreasonable for us to confirm that for them uh, in some capacity, right? And we, we oftentimes do. And so um, well, that's, that's big reason number one, especially early, early on in the first trimester, they come for a pregnancy confirmation. The other two reasons tend to be a little bit more physiologic or, or pathophysiologic, right? They're coming in with some form of abdominal pain or they're coming, coming in with some form of vaginal bleeding. Now, I would be remiss to say that, you know, patients come in with all sorts of random things who are 
pregnant, right? Um, you know, they may come in, they may have sprained their ankle because they're pregnant. They may have come in with chest pain because they're pregnant they may, or, and they're pregnant. They may have come in with like a headache and they're pregnant. And there's all sorts of reasons that you, you know, would want to be concerned about either pregnancy specific things or, um, you know, the pregnancy affecting those things. But early in the first trimester, right? The main reason why patients come in is one of these three things. Hey, I want to know if I'm pregnant or I'm having some abdominal pain and cramping, um, and, and or I'm having some degree of vaginal bleeding, right? And so that leads us down the road to a differential diagnosis. And I usually have some form of conversation with my patients uh, to this capacity of in the first trimester, right? Um, when they come in pregnant in, into the emergency department, there's a differential of, of one of these things could be happening, right? Generally, you don't have, you know, multiple of these things together, right? So one of these things is usually the outcome that they're going to walk out of uh, from the department, right? Either you could say, hey, everything checks out, right? You're having a normal pregnancy, right? And so there is some degree to which vaginal spotting can be normal in early pregnancy. There's some degree to which cramping can be normal in early pregnancy. Um, so we need to decipher, is this you know, in the spectrum of normal, or is this something that we need to be worried about? So that's option number one. Option number two is is largely what a lot of patients come in concerned about, right? Because uh, that's what they have the 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 um, kind of the mental framework um, built out for is. You know, I, I know I'm pregnant. I took my pre home pregnancy test. I'm not coming in to confirm it because I know that I'm pregnant, but I'm having some pain. I'm having some bleeding. My sister-in-law had a miscarriage. He had very similar symptoms. I'm concerned that I'm having a miscarriage. And they may not actually vocalize that specific concern and say, hey, this is what I'm concerned about, right? But when you kind of dig under the surface and say like, uh, say, you know, what are you here for? They may vocalize this. And this is why um, just parenthetically for the, the trainees that are listening to this right now, one one of my favorite questions to ask patients when they come in, especially if I don't really have a clear understanding, like if they come in a bone sticking out of their skin, I'm pretty sure that's why they're here, right? But if I don't have a very clear understanding or they didn't clearly articulate it to me, one of my favorite questions to ask patients is, hey, you know, what is it that brought you in today and what questions can I answer for you, right? Um, you know, and, and I've always tried to find, you know, the, the well, why are you here today can sometimes come across as like this judgmental, um, you know, even though that's not my intent. So I like to add that second question of like, what questions can I answer for you? Because then that gives a context for the the initial like why are we here and what it does is it gives them that opportunity to voice their concern right they're here for a reason they didn't take time out of their busy day just to hang out with me, right? Um, there's not a lot of people that want to do that. Um, they came out because they were worried about something with them or with their pregnancy in this context, and they want that answered, right? And so to get that answer of like, I'm here because I'm concerned that I might be mis having a miscarriage really helps you kind of, number one, order the appropriate test to answer the questions. And number two, be able to answer the questions or knowingly answer the questions so they're not leaving with this, I went to the ER and they did nothing for me, despite the fact that we look at the record and it's like, no, 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 we did all these things for you. And, you know, you'll see that, you know, in your bill later. Uh, so anyway, end of parentheses. Uh, so option number one, normal pregnancy. Option number two, pregnancy loss. Option number three, the patients generally don't come in asking about this, but this is always on our radar, especially early on in pregnancy is, do we have any form of an ectopic pregnancy going on, right? Because that's in this list, right, um, that is the huge emergency that we need to be aware of and we need to be looking out for. Uh, and it's that huge area of unmitigated risk in this patient population that we need to to observe, or to, to identify and to manage, right? So uh, ectopic pregnancy. And the final one is, is there any other pregnancy complication, right? And so this gets that whole, you know, junk drawer of, are there twin pregnancies? Well, we need to kind of know about that. Is there like a molar you know, trophoblastic disease type pregnancy? You know, is there some other issue going on um, that we need to identify um, and, and manage, right? So that's going to be our differential that kind of we're working off of. And so my goals in the ED built on that differential is number one, we need to confirm that the patient is or is not pregnant, right? Because that is, you know, that's a game changer. Like when you come in and have, you know, a young woman who's coming in with abdominal pain and vaginal bleeding, there's a huge difference in management, you know, between if you're pregnant and if you're not pregnant, right? And there's a hu even a huge difference, um, huge difference in the differential diagnosis between those patients. So um, my number one goal is to confirm, yes, you are in fact pregnant and I need to go down that pregnancy route, but also keeping in mind to non-pregnant related things can be happening to you as well, right? Number two, 
my secondary goal is I need to find a way to optimize the maternal health, right? Because without mom being healthy, we're not having a lot of luck with baby, right? We talk about this in the, particularly in the crashing OB patient, right? Resuscitate mom first, right? Baby's important, right? Baby's definitely important, but without mom, there's no baby, right? And so we need to resuscitate mom or optimize mom's health milieu, right? Um, in whatever context that happens to be. And number three is then optimize the environment for fetal development, right? So we want to get out of the way and allow the baby to do what the baby's going to do, and that is grow, right? And usually this comes in the context of I ask the patients, hey, are you on prenatal vitamins already? And if not, can I get you started, right? Um, but also some of it comes in the context of optimizing number two, right? Maternal health, right? And then the final one is to, uh, to know about and screen for maternal and fetal emergencies. And that's kind of where our ultrasound is going to come in, right? So uh, when we think about it, to optimize these four different things, we need to know um, know a few things about the baby. Number one, where is the thing, right? We need to know pregnancy location. Number two, we need to know is this baby viable? And, and by viable, I don't mean if we delivered today, will it survive outside the womb? That, that is a definition of the term viability. But in the context of today's context, viability means is the thing alive? And if you know we do nothing, it will continue to to grow, develop, and live, right? Um, or is the thing, you know, the the antithesis of this f pregnancy viability is, are we looking at a, a pregnancy loss, right? Um, and finally, um, the third thing we need to know is what is the gestational age, right? And I'll say this now, uh, just so I have it on the record. Um, and if I forget to, so if I forget to say it again, uh, we'll have it, um, and, but I'll probably come back to it. In the first trimester, this is one of the most important times to, 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 to do this gestational age assessment, right? And generally speaking, it's done based on dates, dates from last period, right? And so you say, hey, you know, how long has it been since your last period? It's been six weeks. Okay, well, you're approximately six weeks along if your HCG is positive, right? Now, understanding that counts for a period of time between period and conception, right? That may not have existed, right? Um, and so that date is gonna be a little bit artificially long. And so oftentimes what the OBs will do is once we have a really solid ultrasound-based first trimester date, they'll update those dates to that date, right? And so um, it's oftentimes helpful to say this patient is six weeks OB based on last menstrual period, or this patient is six weeks OB based on early first trimester ultrasound. Um, and the thing that we also know is that the early first trimester ultrasound is the most accurate way of dating a pregnancy based on ultrasound. As the baby grows and develops, um, it becomes less and less accurate. And I'll use my, um, one of my, I think it was my niece, um, you know, it wasn't my nephew, it was, it was my niece, um, who by the time we got to the third trimester, the abdominal circumference, the head circumference, and the femur lengths were so different um, that you know it, it had a huge effect of what the estimated day of delivery was based on those three different measurements, right? And um, they're not, you know, my niece was not unique in this context. Uh, and so we want to get this date not, knocked out early, laid down early, so that we can have that um, that base or the framework established for OB, uh, which also means we need to do it correctly, right? And so that's something that we'll talk about in a little bit, right? So those are my three goals. I want to establish where is the baby at, where is the viable, how viable is this baby, and how old is this baby? Because those are the pregnancy related, um, you know, priorities in the emergency department. So how do we do that, right? Once we've established the diagnosis, right? We're going to obtain some labs, right? We're going to get a, a the, first of all, the urine, you know, HCG, we'll take a UA while we're at it. We're going to get a quantitative HCG, right? And that can be helpful, right? We know that early in pregnancy, that HCG rises in a very predictable manner. Um, however, uh, and that's for the normal pregnancy, but when you have an abnormal pregnancy, uh, whether that be a miscarriage or whether it be an ectopic pregnancy, um, that HCG change will be abnormal, right? It won't rise the way you'd predict it to rise. But there's a huge degree of overlap between, um, you know, that that delta HCG that you can see in a miscarriage versus in an ectopic pregnancy. And even like ectopic versus a normal pregnancy, there's a little bit of a, an overlap there. There's a fuzzy line kind of on the, the positive and negative slopes of this graph. And so um, it makes the HCG less reliable of a test to officially establish this diagnosis to, to answer the three questions that we have. And so we're going to have to rely on some form of fetal imaging, right, to, to really help get at those three key questions of where is the thing, is it viable, how old is the thing? And so with that 
framework or with that basis or, or foundation established, what I'd like to do for the remainder of our time is transition to ultrasound, right? And specifically talk about what is the normal first trimester ultrasound so that in subsequent lectures or in the previous lectures that you're going to go back and watch on YouTube because they're there, um, you can then kind of have a, a place to piece those parts in and say, okay, I understand now the big picture, how this is going to fit and kind of why I'm worried and why I'm doing these things, right? And so indications for ultrasound uh, in the first trimester, well, you have a machine and you have a patient. It is that simple. Um, except for the fact that you have to add the nuance that the patient's actually pregnant, right? Um, if they're not pregnant, it would be silly to do a first trimester ultrasound. But since you still have a patient, you still have a machine, you can still scan something else, right? I mean, there's still indications for other things, right? But um, okay, amusing, and, or amusing way of saying it. Um, the indication essentially is you have a patient who's pregnant and oftentimes they're going to come in with some concern for pregnancy related complications, right? And you want to answer one of that three, those three questions. Where is the baby? What's the viability of this baby? And how far along is this baby, right? So that's your indications, right? Pretty broad. Um, now, if they're coming in with complete, and I've seen some people do this, um, if they're coming in for something completely different, like, hey, I sprained my ankle and oh, by the way, I'm 10 weeks pregnant, you know, Sure, if you want to scan, you can, but it's technically not indicated in this context because you don't really have that pregnancy related, uh, the concern for pregnancy related complications. Um, it really takes kind of something that you know, say, hey, I'm concerned that something could be going sideways here. And it may just even be as simple as answering one of these questions, right? You may have already established where's the baby at. You may already know the gestational age, but you want to say, you know, I want to check a heart rate today. I, I want to check for the viability today. <coughs> Right, so um, that's our indications. Um, moving on to kind of patient and probe uh, preparation, right? How do we do this study? Um, from a patient standpoint, essentially you're gonna lay the patient down in the supine um, orientation, um, as we do for most of our studies. Uh, um, you know, it's helpful to have them in a hospital gown. It's helpful to bring a towel in there so you can kind of tuck, uh, tuck and cover certain things just to kind of provide a window to what you need but not expose the patient unnecessarily. Uh, but the big thing that you wanna really keep in mind is you want to keep that bladder full if you can, right? And I'll use the word if you can, because the ED logistics don't tend to, to favor um, the ultrasound here, right? So um, the, the reason for the bladder full is it, it provides a nice sonographic window. If you have that, that fluid there, it displaces bowel to the north, right? It displaces bowel cephalad. Uh, it, it serves as a window to look right at the uterus just deep to that. And so we get a better view. However, Oftentimes what happens is the patient comes into the emergency department, they go through triage, the triage nurse says, oh, you might be pregnant, here's a urine cup, the bathroom's right there, as soon as you come back, we'll get you in a room. So the patient's already voided, they get placed in a room, now you walk in, they've just gone to the bathroom, and they have an empty bladder, and it's like, oh, you're pregnant, the HCG is positive, now let's do his ultrasound, and the, you know, the bladder's empty. So... I haven't come up with a great workaround for that one yet. If anyone has any ideas, post it in the comments uh, for the video or in the comments um, of this live Zoom. Uh, but generally speaking, that's what happens. So you kind of have to work around that bladder uh, issue. But in an ideal world, if things were operated the way you want it, you want to have that bladder full for this transabdominal ultrasound, right? And then from a machine standpoint, obviously you're gonna do all the normal stuff, you know, probe indicator towards the head, probe indicator towards the right for normal conventions. You, you drive it up to the right-hand side of the patient, uh, your left-hand side, you scan. Um, you're gonna probably start off with the curvilinear transducer because it gives us, you know, a nice, um, broad view of the intra-abdominal area. It gives us deep penetration because of its low frequency. And so it's going to give us the, the views that we need of the, the, um, the uterus and kind of the surrounding structures, right? And that's usually what I'm going to start with. And oftentimes what I find, especially for, for trainees, is they place, place the probe a little bit high, right? Uh, in the first trimester, the, the uterus is still tucked way down in the pelvis. And so you got to go low, uh, can be kind of awkward. So um, I'll oftentimes, you know, tuck, the, tuck a towel in the waistband, kind of hook the, the trailing edge um, of the probe kind of under that waistband. And then I, kind of with this sweep push down and kind of look down and get towards that bladder area and then kind of, you know, find the uterus right behind that bladder, right? And so that's our patient and probe prep preparation. Um, what about the anatomy, right? What about the normal anatomy you need to think about? And so the first thing I'll do is oftentimes just do a, well, I like the sagittal orientation kind of as my first view because I can find the uterus, right? I can get a nice broad understanding of everything going on in the pelvis and in 
the intra-abdominal area um, by finding that uterus and centering it up, right? And I, I sweep from side to side until I get a view of the uterus, kind of the uterine fundus where it says uterus there. Um, and it kind of cones all the way down to the cervix, that deep part. And there's that elbow bend and then kind of that little hyper or that um, – that line just, you know, to the right of the uterus, which represents the vaginal canal, right? And find that whole, you know, uterine cervical vaginal complex, right? And if I can see all that, I know my depth is good because I want to see just deep to that in that pouch of Douglas, because that is where fluid is going to collect in the supine patient. So as I scan, I want to be able to look and see, is there, you know, not only what's going on in the uterus, but is there any free fluid associated with this patient, right? And it's all predicated on being oriented relative to the bladder, which you can see labeled up there in the top right. Um, so if you find that bladder, kind of scan this uh, to find this type of image. Most patients will look just like this. There are a handful of patients who are retroverted or retroflexed where the uterus kind of tilts backwards. Uh, and those are a lot more difficult to see because there's a lot of room for the bowel to kind of creep over top. Um, and so if you're not seeing anything, um, you have to consider the idea that you're, you're retroflexed and, and maybe you're going to have to transition over to a transvaginal approach as opposed to a transabdominal approach. So that's our basic sagittal uterus sano anatomy. <coughs> From a transverse standpoint, it's kind of like doing a parasternal short axis of the heart, right? It depends on where you cut it. And so in this image, we're cutting it up towards the uterine fundus. Um, but if you go transverse, you can scan up towards the fundus, right? And I'll, and I'll oftentimes scan all the way up through the fundus so the uterus goes away. And then kind of scan through the uterus all the way down to the cervix, right? So I get a nice transverse view of the whole thing. Um, and if you look, and I don't have it here, but if you look side to side, right, you can look all the way out and you'll see this dark, um, like hypo, well, is it bright? The hyperechoic followed by a shadow border on either side. Just gonna be ili your your iliac crest, and inside that is gonna be your iliac vessels. Uh, and the space between the iliac vessels and your uterus is gonna be those the adnexa, right? The adnexal territory. And so, um, generally speaking, I'll I'll just find the uterus. I'll scan up and down on that. Uh, if I have any concerns, I can kind of tilt out into the adnexa on either side, right? So that's transverse. Um, if we kind of drill down specifically on the uterus, and this is obviously a transvaginal image, but the, the anatomy is the same whether you approach it transabdominally or transvaginally. Um, if you look at the uterus specifically, there is kind of that outer mantle of myometrium, right? Um, and then there's a hyperechoic line uh, that runs down the middle of the uterus, right? And it gets you know larger in early the early parts of pregnancy. That's the endometrium, right? Um, and that is usually a definitive, distinct ish line that's that endometrial stripe. And so these are just important, you know, landmarks that you're going to want to look for because when you put a baby in there, right, um, or even when you put fluid in there, you want to see it kind of eccentrically located in the endometrium off of the endometrial stripe, not within that endometrial stripe because anything in the endometrial stripe is concerned for something in transit uh, as opposed to something implanted kind of in that endometrial, endomyometrial, you know, area uh, of the uterus, right? And so that's our basic anatomy anatomy, kind of backing up and coming back to those three questions, location, viability, and gestational age, we're going to look and see how ultrasound, with that anatomy context in mind, how we can assess each of these questions with our ultrasound, right? And we'll take them in turn. So number one, pregnancy location, right? The pregnancy it, the normal first trimester pregnancy ought to be in the fundus, right? The fundus is, des, is the part of the uterus that's designed to have babies, right? They're not designed to be down the cervix. They're not designed to out, be out in like the kind of the, um, you know, out, out far on the periphery. They're designed to be kind of in the sol solidly in the fundus, like I said, a little bit eccentrically off of the uterine stripe. And I know um, Dr. Bob Jones, who's one of our faculty, he was my uh, my fellowship uh, director when I went through fellowship. He's the one that's taught me um, the old time when I was going through residency as well. One of the things that he constantly uh, would say in all of his OB lectures is like, think of it like a cul-de-sac, like you're driving into a neighborhood, you drive down the cul-de-sac, that's the endometrial stripe, right? Where do you build the houses? You don't build them in the middle of the road, right? You build them along the periphery of the road around that cul-de-sac. And the same thing here, like you're looking for something eccentrically located off of the endometrium in that uterine fundus, kind of at the end of the cul-de-sac. Right. And so when you scan, you definitely want to scan looking in two views, right? You want to scan in that sagittal orientation, right? And you also want to scan in the transverse orientation. We've had 
had examples where um, overzealous trainees have come and said, hey, look at this amazing intrauterine pregnancy that I found. They scan it in one view, and when you turn it in the other view, you realize it's actually not intrauterine, it's somewhere else, right? Um, so you definitely want to catch that. And if you do the trans sagittal and transverse, you will be able to confirm that both of them are intrauterine, that this is, in fact, an intrauterine pregnancy, right? So it's that philosophy of two views is one view, one view is no views, right? Uh, two is one, one is none. So definitely scan in two orthogonal planes, right? So that's the first key is that it needs to be in a fundal location. Um, and I've already kind of harped on this one. It needs to be that eccentric location. So if you see in this image, you can see that hyperechoic uh, endometrial stripe that's coming up from the bottom right. Um, in this gestational sac is just off of that endometrial stripe in the, you know, it's Im embedded in the endometrium, um, but it's just eccentric to that endometrial stripe. So it fits that cul-de-sac uh, example of the eccentric location, right? And the final thing that you want to ensure um, is that there's sufficient endomyometrium surrounding that gestational sac um, that would represent this being definitively in the uterine fundus. And this can be a little bit challenging, right? But here we're getting at the idea of that corneal ectopic, right? So one of the rare complications of early pregnancy is you can have ectopic pregnancies, right? Um, maybe not so rare, uh, but one of the rare forms of ectopic is it implants kind of in that corneal area. So right as the fallopian tubes enter the uterus, it implants right there. Well, that's a problem because number one, it's not technically in the you know, endometrial area, right? And number two, it's near the periphery. And so these can rupture and they tend to rupture. And when they rupture, they bleed like crazy, right? And so you definitely want to make sure you don't have a corneal ectopic. And so there's a number of studies that we're looking at, you know, how do we best, you know, identify these? And we'll, we're going to refer to the OB docs because they're actually really, really hard to identify sonographically. Uh, it may need multiple forms of imaging to do. Um, but there's some literature that would suggest that if your endomyometrial um, border is less than seven millimeters, right, that you need to be concerned about this corneal ectopic, right? And then if you exclude the endometrium, if it's just myometrium, they say five millimeters, right? And so I don't measure all of these, but I also, you know, when I'm scanning through in transverse and sag, just notice, is there a sufficient quantity of tissue surrounding this gestational sac that would, you know, exceed that five to seven millimeter mark uh, if I were to measure it, uh, suggesting that this thing is actually intrauterine and not the like corneal ectopic, right? And so those are the three things. Fundal location, eccentric off the endometrial stripe, sufficient tissue around it to allow for continued expansion, right? And so that answers the question of where is this pregnancy? And if we don't see any of these three criteria, then we have to say it's pregnancy of unknown location. Um, and that fits kind of further down in the algorithm, kind of away from the normal first trimester study. And that'll be covered in, in a, different, a different lecture, right? So the second question we need to answer is, is this baby viable, right? And re again, remember, we define viability as if we do nothing, it will continue to live, right? Not viability of if we deliver the thing, will it live outside of mom? Like that is definitely a definition. Um, in fact, it's one of the more common definitions of viability when it's, as it pertains to pregnancy. But for today, is it viable um, in that it will continue, continue living or are we concerned about like a miscarriage, right? And so the way we do this is assess for the presence of a fetal heartbeat, right? And so you can assess for fetal heartbeat in, in one of two ways right? You can directly observe it, right? And so if you see in this example on the left, um, when we kind of center up over that chest, you'll see a little flicker uh, right in the middle of the chest um, that represents the patient's heartbeat. Um, and this is oftentimes visible early, early on. It's um, embryologically, it starts kind of in that six to seven-ish week mark. Um, and so oftentimes when I scan, by the time I actually see a fetal pole, I've got a heartbeat, right? Um, in that six week mark. Um, it becomes more and more obvious as we get bigger, but you can, you know, you can oftentimes detect it even down to that six week mark, right? Um, and again, if you don't have a heartbeat, that gets you down into the, you know, the pregnancy failure, the potential for pregnancy failure um, algorithm. Um, and there's there's a whole pathway that that follows. And we do have a video about that up on the YouTube channel um, about pregnancy failure. So go ahead and watch that. Uh, in that video, I discuss the four criteria to define a pregnancy failure in the first trimester, two times based to size based criteria. So go take a look at that. Um, but you can directly visualize it. That doesn't do a ton of good unless we're saving clips, at least for documentation purposes. And so oftentimes what we'll do is throw, well, not oftentimes, what we do in a, as part of our normal protocol is we do an M mode through that heartbeat and we look for the, the kind of the up and down um, 
spikes representing that fetal heartbeat. And then there's a calculator inside the, the, the machine that allows us to then turn that distance uh, of, of t- a distance into a time and a time into a, a fetal heart rate. And so our machines use a, a two a two beat peak that requires you to skip one. Some machines are just beat to beat. So you just got to know your machine, who, you know, the manufacturer, kind of what, cal- what form of calculation they use so you can get the appropriate one. Um, as you're measuring this, right? And so a couple little nuance points, things that I've picked up over the years. Um, I find it helpful to do the side-by-side M mode to 2D. You can set up your machine to do over, under, or side-by-side. In this context, I like side-by-side because I've done some QAs in the past where the it's been documented there was a, a fetal bradycardia with a heart rate in the 60s. Um, and when you look at it, they're measuring something that's way down low in the M mode. In fact, you can see it in this M mode tracing about three quarters of the way down. You can see another, you know, um, rhythmic tracing and that's the maternal heartbeat right and so i've seen people measure mom's heart rate call it baby's heart rate uh, fortunately it doesn't happen often but when you do the side by side it helps you see okay this tracing corresponds at least from a depth perspective with the place where the baby's at inside the uterus and so this is the appropriate tracing to measure right um the other thing i've noticed or i've noticed is actually, actually I was taught this one uh, diane our our sonographer who you guys will get to meet here very shortly um she taught me this one but put the calipers above or below not right on top of the the tracing uh, because it makes it easier to see you know where that that tracing starts and stops right just a little you know technique thing that just makes your life a lot easier and if you want to see an example of that go we did a go to the youtube channel we did a youtube short just demonstrating um kind of how to put that above and below um that tracing right so again assessing for fetal viability we're looking for a fetal heart rate and we should see something kind of in the neighborhood of about that 100 to 180 beats per minute. (coughs) So this is an example of um, a lack of viability, right? So this is a miscarriage in process. Um, So we see no fetal heart tracing um, on the M mode. um, And then when we use color Doppler, we should demonstrate that there's no flow inside that that fetus. Um, And I guess as a, a quick aside here, We use M mode because it is a low power way of assessing a fetal heart rate or or, or movement essentially, which is, you know, heart rate will will produce movement. Um, When you use color Doppler or power, color power angio, it changes the amount of power that's put into the patient, right? You'll notice your MIs and your TIs increase, right? And so for the mom, no big problem, right? For a baby, right, for a small structure, these structures are more sensitive to these changes in mechanical and thermal uh, thermal indices, uh, specifically the mechanical indices. And so we want to limit the amount of power that um, the baby is experiencing, right? The amount of, you know, sound or sound, you know, energy the baby's experiencing. And so we try to avoid Doppler, right, in the early first trimester. Right. Is it going to be like a, a one second is going to cause, you know, imminent harm? No, but we want to avoid it and we want to avoid the extra energy input. And so we just try to stay away from it, um, you know, pretty much for, for all of our cases. Right. So that's fetal viability. The final question we want to answer is this question of gestational age. <coughs> right. Uh, and so... Um, As we look at gestational age, we can notice that there is a very predictable pattern early in the first trimester, right? So when you scan patients, when you scan them, um, there is going to be a a lower limit to when we can actually see patient or see babies in the the um, sonographically, which is our machines are not microscopic, right? They're macroscopic. And so usually in about the four to five week mark, we can start seeing things from a transvaginal perspective. In about five weeks, we can start seeing things from a transabdominal perspective. Pardon me. Uh, so the first thing we'll oftentimes see um, in about five weeks is this gestational sac that appears, right? It's this uh, fluid-filled cavity. <coughs> <coughs> this fluid-filled cavity um, kind of eccentrically located in the endo, uh, endometrium. Um, 
And it's it's usually kind of predictable around five weeks, right? And then about five and a half weeks is predictably about when we start seeing the yolk sac, right? That that small little Cheerio like thing that develops inside um, that in, that gestational sac, right? And this is the area that's got the the nutrients that the baby's going to feed on until the placenta is hooked up. It's got it's the the original place for hematopoiesis. It's a very important structure uh, in the development of this baby. And then about six weeks we start seeing um, the fetal pole that's attached just next to that yolk sac, right? But it'll be very distinct from the yolk sac. It looks like a teeny tiny little grain of rice that's a couple millimeters long, right? A couple things that are important to note here, right? There's some literature that would discuss this idea of a double decidual sign as the first um, sonographic identifier of a pregnancy, right? And this has been debated a little bit. Um, most experts don't say that the double decidual sign is definitive enough, but will oftentimes say it's, you know, if, if you're a normal pregnancy, you're going to, you're, you can have it, right? But not all patients who have this finding can you rely specifically on, on, you know, for, for, gestational age, right? Um, so this double decidual sign, if you go back to that left side image, you can see kind of a double halo around that gestational sac, right? Uh, there's the, decidu the decidua capsularis and the decidua vera, I believe is the two different names. Um, but it's part of that endometrial reaction that happens as the baby implants and kind of the the, the endometrium and the, the tissue grows kind of around that gestational sac, right? Um, and so Theoretically, you can say if you have a double decidual sign, you know, that's suggestive of an intrauterine pregnancy. However, most experts, and I fall in this camp, will agree that the first definitive sign of an intrauterine pregnancy, right? The first thing you can hang your head on and say, this is intrauterine, this is not extrauterine, we're good to go, is this yolk sac, right? And if you take any form of a test uh, about bedside ultrasound, the answer is gonna be the yolk sac. It's the first definitive sign that this, you have an intrauterine pregnancy, right? That's the image that we see in the middle with that teeny tiny little, that little Cheerio. And once you see that, right, if, you, if that's all you see, you can give the patient the reassurance of you have an IUP, right? Now we can manage the other things, right? We can figure this out. Right. Um, and that, like I said, generally develops at about five and a half week mark. Um, and then, you know, if you if you are farther along that, you can see the fetal pole. And that's that's pretty good. Right. Um, after that, it's kind of this progression um, of of normal findings. Right. So um, here you see in the in the top left image that yolk sac at five weeks, about six weeks, you, you can see that teeny tiny little Cheerio. Um, and oftentimes what you'll see is like the top half will blink on and off, kind of like a little lightning bug. Um, that is the fetal heart rate in that six week uh, little embryo, right? At seven weeks, you're oftentimes a little bit bigger. And by eight weeks, you're starting to look like a gummy bear, right? It kind of has that stubby little arm, stubby little legs. There's not a lot of definition in the neck. It's just kind of that it's gummy bear type of appearance. Nine weeks, you're, you're still a gummy bear-ish. And by the time you hit 10 weeks, you start seeing a little bit more definition to the extremities, a little bit more definition to the neck. Um, and then that 10, 11, 12 weeks, same type of thing, but it just grows. It you know, basically gets bigger, right? Um, and so the, the, um, what you'll notice is obviously the size is very consistent uh, in the early weeks, that six, seven, eight, nine, even ish to 10 weeks. Once you start getting the ability to flex your neck, right, which happens at 10, 11, 12 weeks, then our, our size, our ability to calculate the gestational age based on size begins to become less accurate. So really that target period you want to look at is at six to 10-ish weeks uh, to get our first gestational age calculation. So how do you do that? Well, there's two ways of doing this. Um, obviously, uh, if you have a baby, that's one way of doing it. And if you don't have a baby, you're not out of luck. That's the second way. And we'll talk about that one first, right? So if there's no baby um, in that's identifiable in the this gestational sac, uh, we know that this gestational sac can expand um, in those early, you know, four, five, six week mark uh, in a predictable manner, right? So if you measure a sac diameter, right, get that mean sac diameter, there's calculators that can be used to kind of estimate a rough gestational age. So just like you'd measure a bladder with your AP, your cephalid caudad, and your um, lateral distance, uh, you can measure the same three cardinal di directions in your gestational sac, plug it into that calculator there, and it will spit out an estimated gestational age. Now, one caveat is, and I oftentimes see this in the radiology reports, is they have a mean sac diameter correlating with a six-week pregnancy. <coughs> 
that's great and congratulations, but that is not definitively diagnostic of a pregnancy or intrauterine pregnancy, right? You just have a sac, right? And if you could theoretically have a, a pseudo sac and measure that and get a estimated gestational age based on that pseudo sac. And so until you see that yolk sac or that fetal pole is not definitively diagnostic, but in those early phases where you're struggling to get other def- other forms of dating, this can help you kind of put the patient's age, or the, the fe- fetal age on kind of on a map, right? The second way that we do it, right, is when you see the baby, right? And so this is essentially measuring the crown rump length, right? And this is how you get that that gestational age, that very accurate one. So we want to isolate the baby, right, scan and find the baby, and then twist that probe um, kind of in the right orientation so you get the complete long axis of that fetal pole, right? And make sure you exclude the yolk sac. So you don't want to include the yolk sac. You want just the fetal pole. One end of it will be the top of its head. The other end will be its rear, Right. And um, oftentimes at this stage, there's not a lot of you know arms and legs in the way to kind of to cloud that. Um, but as you get kind of in that 11, 12 week mark, you got to be careful. <coughs> so find the top of the head, find the bottom of the rear, place your calipers um, on either on the, both those points. And it'll give you a it'll spit out um, a calculated gestational age based on that crown rump length, right? And so the key is you don't want to include arm and legs. You don't want to include the yolk sac. You want to make sure you're in that longest axis. And I know our protocol is we do a, you know, basically a 2D image without zoom. Um, when I talk to some of the OB docs, they actually prefer throwing zoom on. So if you're having a hard time seeing it, put the zoom on and maybe you can get a... <coughs> Sorry, I'm fighting a nasty cough up here. Um, maybe you can get an, a little bit of a, a better definition of exactly where you need to be. Uh, put those calipers to get that 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 really good head, or crown, and rump length, right? And so that is kind of the asset, the way of getting your your gestational age assessment, right? That there gives you about four images in your protocol, right? That's going to be our basic first trimester ultrasound. Now, we know that normal pregnancies are not the only thing that happened, right? We talked about the differential diagnosis. And so other things you may identify is an ectopic pregnancy, pregnancy failure, multiple pregnancies, heterotopic pregnancies, or even molar pregnancies. All those are topics for a different time, but just know that these are other things that you may identify in your first trimester study. And so when you see things that violate what we d- what we just showed you as the normal, then you have to start thinking down this list. <coughs> So finally, just to review, right, we're talking about pregnancy, that state of bringing a baby into the world, right? And the pregnancy is that period of the time when the baby is inside the uterus and not outside in the world, right? We talked about the fact that the patients will come in with various different complications, whether it be abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding, or just want to know that they're pregnant. And so our three things that we need to identify, the three questions that we need to answer is where's baby, is baby viable? And what's the gestational age, right? And so we used our ultrasound to help us identify where is baby? It should be in that fundal location. Number two, does it have a heartbeat? Yes or no. Um, and And what is that heartbeat? Is it within normal parameters? And number three, how far along is baby by measuring with that crown rump length? So that kind of wraps up the normal first trimester ultrasound. Hopefully that's helpful for you. Um, and, uh, and and from there, we're going to build other portions of this exam. Obviously, you can see kind of the, the place, the launch pads for all these other different topics kind of as we expand out um, more on OB ultrasound. So stay tuned. We're going to bring more to you. There's a couple other lectures I know already on the YouTube channel. We have a lecture on uh, pregnancy failure. We also have a lecture on ectopic pregnancies. And so go take a look at those. Um, But with that being said, are there any questions right now? Anything you guys want to add? I know we have a couple of our ultrasound experts on um, or any questions from, from the people who are listening to us right now.